We, uh, we're in a series called The Kings in the Kingdom, and what we've been looking at uh, over the last few weeks together is uh, really the, the kind of the Old Testament leadership that we see uh, that was operating with Israel in the Old Testament and seeking to take from uh, this leadership both good and bad leadership, if you follow the history of the, the Israelite leadership, um, kind of look at that and go, okay, what can we learn from this? What can we pull from this? Uh, where do we see ourselves in uh, these kind of various ways? And and ultimately what it, it leads us to or what it will lead you to if you look at it long enough is, is recognizing the fact that uh, there's not an earthly leader alive uh, who can do uh, and accomplish what Jesus could do and what Jesus was going to uh, accomplish. Uh, one of the questions that I've been thinking a lot about lately um, is really this question of why do great leaders uh, fail? Like, why do, do great leaders, and, and, and kind of like Christian leaders, as I've kind of navigating ministry, I've been in ministry about 20 years now, and one of the things that I've seen over the last 20 years is, is really incredible Christian leaders, people who were kind of culture creators, people who understood the scriptures, people who built um, organizations and churches, and, and were leading out in front of, and, and doing some really remarkable things, and, and one of the things that I've just seen really ramped up over the last few years or so is one after the the other massive failure after massive failure. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if, if you're kind of keeping up and, and, and watching it. Uh, you, you can look from uh, you can look from all the kind of uh, different models that exist within the church. So you kind of have the uh, kind of the attractional model with this kind of like the Hillsong model, right? So it's it's clean and it's polished, and and you've seen that. You, we've seen the destruction of leaders who fall. We've seen leaders who would be considered missional leaders. Uh, these are the leaders that are kind of in the street and they're doing incarnational ministry. So it's not the this big attractive thing, and yet there are leaders in the missional movement who have uh, fallen. There are leaders in kind of the um, very conservative, what you would consider like reformed, expository preaching, uh, kind of philosophical model of the church. Those uh, recently, uh, a leader in that particular kind of world has fallen. There has been the very charismatic, uh, a guy that, that built this huge kind of prayer ministry, you would consider him in the charismatic group, uh, a legend in that world uh, recently has fallen. It's like, it, it, it really doesn't matter uh, apologetics, whatever it looks like. Uh, uh, just over the last few years, I've just been going like, why do these leaders uh, who supposedly, it seems like they're dialed in in life with God, why do they fail? I think it's a, a super valuable um, question because it doesn't really matter the leadership paradigm that you're operating um, out of uh, one after the other. Now, I, I will say just as a caveat as we get into this, uh, I think what we've seen over the last few years is, is actually in many ways a good thing. I think God has been cleaning out his church. I think God's been exposing um, the, the leadership that needed to be exposed uh, with, with the idea and the anticipation that, that something's going to uh, happen. But what I want to look at this morning is a, is a king whose storyline very much kind of mimics this, this line or this idea of, of someone who had an incredible um, beginning, an incredible walk uh, with God, and yet falls um, at the end of his life. And so this morning I want to look at uh, Solomon. So let me give you just a brief kind of overview of Solomon's life. So the, the king, as you think about the kingship of Israel, you had uh, Saul who was set up first, and then last week we looked at David. David was the second king of Israel, was considered the greatest king of Israel, uh, and then you have Solomon who comes after uh, King David. And so <laughs> Solomon is the son of David and Bathsheba. Uh, he reigned over Israel for about 40 years or so. Uh, if you follow his story at all, he's kind of known for the, the wisdom that he had, the wealth that he had kind of the, the overall magnificence of his kingdom. Uh, he's the one for the people of Israel. He's the one that built the temple of God. So this was the temple that David wanted to build. And God said, no, David, you're not going to build it. Your son Solomon is going to build it. So Solomon builds uh, the temple. It's magnificent. Uh, Solomon also builds uh, a palace. It actually takes him long. This should probably give a little bit of a hint to what's going to happen. But it takes Solomon longer to build his personal palace. And it took them to build the temple of God. Um, so probably given us 
us a little bit of an indicator there into his particular life, but these are two things that he's really uh, known for. Uh, his anointing, so um, in 1 Kings 1, 28 through uh, 40, Solomon is chosen from all the, the sons of David to be the one that is going to succeed him as king. Uh, he's not the oldest son of the kingdom, uh, but under the kind of the direction of God, uh, Solomon is the one who's kind of risen to uh, the top. In 1 Kings chapter 2, 1 through 4, uh, David on his deathbed, he basically says to Solomon as he's dying, if you will follow in God's ways and you'll stay faithful to the law of Moses, life will go well for you. Right? So on his, again, on his deathbed, David's like, son, let me get you in close. If you'll follow the ways of God and the laws, um, and, and the laws of Moses, life will go well uh, for you. Okay, let's look at, um, Tucker read it for us, but this is the, the primary area that I want us to kind of operate out of is going to be in 1 Kings uh, chapter 3. So if you have a Bible, 1 Kings chapter 3, and we'll kind of journey through this particular part of the scripture. Let me pray for us, then we'll, we'll dive into it. Father, we thank you for this morning. We just would ask that your spirit would help us as we uh, dive into this, as we seek to understand it, um, not simply to understand the, the text, but to be transformed as a people. And so we need your help this morning. We need the spirit's assistance this morning. Father, I pray where this morning, uh, where it may need to do the work of conviction, I pray that it would do the work of conviction. I pray where it would, this, this morning would need to do the work of encouragement, that it would do the work of encouragement. Whether it would need to be informative, it would do the in, informing, Father. Whatever purposes that you need to accomplish this morning, Father, we ask that you would do it. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, First Kings uh, chapter 3. We're going to start in verse, we'll start in verse 3, and we'll look at 3 through 5. Now, I do want to say what we're going to see at the, the very beginning of here is a, a bit complex, and it speaks towards the nature of God's relationship with humanity, and it's kind of an indicator of the fact that a human leader was never going to be what Jesus was. Okay, so Solomon, 1 Kings chapter 3, starting in verse 3, it says this. It says, Solomon loved the Lord by walking in the statues of his father, uh, David. All right, so, so, so far, so good. He's, he's doing what David has asked on his deathbed. He says, just follow in the way of the Lord. But look at the second part of verse 3. Right off the bat, it gets very complex. He says, Solomon loved the Lord by walking the statue of his father David. And it says, but, right? So that's a conjunction. So anytime you see but in a scripture, that's okay. It's, it's transitioning us to like a new, some of you are giggling because I said but. It's all right. Um, so it's, it transitions us into kind of a, a new stage in the, the sentence, right? So he says, but he also, now look what it says here. This gives us an indicator of type of leader or man that Solomon was going to be. It says, but he also sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. Now, anytime the scripture talks about about the high places, uh, what it's talking about is it's talking about these areas or these places where pagan gods would be placed in Israel. And so you would look up onto the high places, depending on where you were, and this would be the area where they would be sacrificing to the pagan gods. So it says he sacrificed, he was burning incense on the high places. Verse 4 says the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there because it was the most uh, famous high place. It says he offered, this is pretty impressive, it says he offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. Verse 5, it says that Gibeon, the Lord, appeared to Solomon in a dream at night. And look at this request, God says, or this question, God said, ask what I should give you. An amazing question. Solomon, ask anything and I'll give you whatever you, whatever you ask for. First Kings 3 Verse 6. So Solomon replied, this is an amazing reply. He says, You have shown great and faithful love to your servant, my father David, because, so he's indicating why God has shown great and faithful love, because he walked before you in faithfulness, righteousness, and integrity, and you have continued this great and faithful love to him by giving him a son to sit on his throne as it is today. Verse 7, Lord my God, you have now made your servant king in Father David's place, yet I am just a youth with no experience in uh, leadership. Now, right off the bat, that's pretty impressive because uh, Solomon's a young dude, and most young dudes would have been like, give me the keys to the car, right? They would have been like, no, I'm, right, I'm ready for this. But Solomon recognizes and goes, I don't have the, I don't have the experience, I don't, I'm, I'm a youth to, to lead your people. 
So he's have no experience in leadership. Verse 8. It says, Your servant is among your people. You have chosen a people too many to be numbered or to be counted. Now here's verse 9. Here's, the, here's what Solomon asked of God. He says, So give your servant a receptive heart to judge your people and discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? So instead of asking for wealth and power, Solomon humbly before God says, would you give me a heart to judge your people and to discern between good and evil? Now, what's God's response to this request of Solomon? 1 Kings 3, verse 10. It says, now it pleased the Lord that Solomon had requested this so God said to him, because you have requested this and did not ask for a long life or riches for yourself or the death of your enemies, but you asked discernment for yourself to administer justice, I will therefore do what you've asked. I will give you a wise and understanding heart so that there will never be anyone like you before and never be anyone again. In addition, so now he's going to add on to that, verse 13. In addition, I'll give you what you did not ask for, both riches and honor, so that no king will be your equal during your entire life. Verse 14, if you walk in my ways and keep my statutes and commands just as your father David did, I'll also give you a long life. Now, I love uh, Solomon's request. We know it was a good request because the scriptures tell us that it pleases God. That the prayer that Solomon was offering before God was a prayer that was pleasing God. It was a prayer that was aligned with the heart of God. I, I think kind of as I've gotten older in my walk with Jesus and in my kind of Christian discipleship and spiritual um, discipleship, I'm, I'm more and more trying to align my prayers in such a way that please the heart of the Father. I'm trying to more and more pray prayers that are, are pleasing to him, right? So I'm, I'm reading the scriptures. I'm looking at Christian history. I'm, I'm trying to lean into the, the, I'm trying to listen to the spirit and go like, okay, I want my prayer similar to Solomon to please the heart of the father. I want them to be informed in this way. Notice the content of the prayer. First Kings chapter three, verse nine a couple of things he, he would ask here. He says, give me a receptive heart. Why does he ask for a receptive heart? What the heck does that even mean? He says, well, I need a receptive heart because I want to be able to judge your people. That's the first role that I, I want to be able to do well is I need to be able to provide judgment over the people that you've given me. And then number two, he says, I want to be able to discern between good and evil. And he says, if I don't have your help, I will not be able to judge the people correctly, and I will not be able to discern between good and evil. Now, this is, this is insightful for us. He says, God, I need your help to discern between what is good and evil, what is right and what is wrong. I, I need an impartation of your wisdom. Would you do this for me? Now, it, it pleases God, because God actually says in 1 Kings 3, verse 11, notice what he says, because there are other things that could have, there are other prayers that Solomon could have made that didn't align with the heart of God. I'm not saying they're good, I'm not saying they're bad, but notice what God says in 1 Kings cha uh, chapter 3, verse 11. He says, the fact that you did not ask for, this, this all, it's, it's like Aladdin, right, where Aladdin uh, rubs on the genie lamp and the, the you know, uh, the genie comes up, right? Some of you it's Will Smith, for other of you it's Robin Williams. All right, so... Uh, uh, Robin Williams, don't sleep on him. All right, so God says you could have asked for all kinds of things. He says you, you could have asked for a long life. You could have asked for riches for yourself. You could have asked for the death of your enemies. But he says you didn't. What type of prayer did Solomon pray, right? Because we're going to get to where he rebels, but there is some good stuff on the front end that I want us to just kind of recognize before we go slamming him on the second part of his life, right? On, on the first part of his life, notice the, the type of prayer that he's praying, right? It's not a selfish prayer. It's not, it's not a prayer rooted in self-preservation, uh, right? That would be give me a long life. That would be give me riches. That would be get, uh, kill my enemies. What does Solomon, what kind of prayer does he pray? Solomon says this to God. God, I see what you've given in front of me. This is how I'm trying to pray more. He says, God, I see the kingdom in front of me. I see the resources of the kingdom behind me. I see the, the might of Israel. I see the riches of Israel. I, I see what you've given me. And I see the people in front of me. And so he says, will you, 
Will you help me steward the things that you've entrusted to me? It's a stewardship prayer. That, that's all that it is. It, he just, he's not asking for, for more things. Solomon just says, I see what you've given me in this part of my life, and all I'm asking is that you would help me to steward it. It's a stewardship prayer. Stewardship prayers are prayers that please the heart of God. They're, they're greater prayers than self-preservation prayers. I want us to be a people in a church who, in trying to mimic the life of Solomon by praying stewardship prayers. God, who, who have you placed in front of me? God, what gifts have you put in my life? What resources have you given me for this time of my life? Whether you're 18, 19, 20, in your 50s, in your 40s, right, in your 60s, what, whatever that looks like, you're going, what's, what's in front of me? What do I have access to by given, uh, um, given from the Father? What do I have access to? God, help me. Would you help me? And so this is what Solomon does. He, he, it's, again, it's not bad to, to pray prayers of, of an increase of influence, but he says, man, I see what's in front of me. Would you help me? Would you give me wisdom to know how to do this? He wants to, again, align with the heart of God. Now, where did this come from? It probably, where did this type of prayer or life come from? It, it probably came from his father, probably came from David. If we, if we look at the life of David, he wrote many of the Psalms. Uh, he led the Israels. Uh, he led the Israelites into a time of prosperity. He experienced the supernatural power of God in slaying Goliath. We saw last week that he was an example of the Father by extending covenantal love to Mephibosheth. Now, I, I, I want to pause here for a moment as we're thinking about this idea of prayer and a stewardship prayer. And, and I just want to reiterate this. I just want to say it as, as clear as I know how to say it. God wants to answer your prayers. I think some of you don't believe that. I think some of you believe when you pray to God, his natural inclination is no. Now, does God say no to our prayers? This is the easiest answer in the world. Yes, there, there are times at which what we're praying does not happen. It's, it's very similar to I have a 12 year old and a six year old, right? <clears throat> if I said yes to every request that my six year old son, you know, came to me with, right, he'd be, you know, uh, living on a steady diet of Twix, Snickers, and Kit Kats. And as wonderful as that sounds, I uh, probably would be shipped away for parent neglect, right? So every request that you receive in the same way that a parent re receives a request, I don't mean to dumb this down, there are, there are prayers that we pray that God does not answer, this has been true in my own life, that hurt deeply. So I'm not downplaying that. I'm just saying that the Father sees far, far more in front of us than we do, right? Uh, Tim Keller used to say, um, I love, he would say, when it, when it comes to our life of prayer and request before God, he would say, if you knew everything that God knew, um, if you knew everything that God knew that he was going to do through that unanswered prayer, you would pray it the way that God would want you to pray it. And he just says, we don't have that. We don't have the access to everything that God's seeking to do. But, but I do just want to say, in, in looking at the life of Solomon, God wants to answer your prayers. He wants you to boldly request of him. Jesus, in his uh, teaching about uh, prayer, this is one of Jesus' most fundamental teachings about prayer. Do, do you know what he says? He says, if you who are evil dads, if you are evil fathers, if you know how to give good gifts, won't your heavenly father, your perfect heavenly father, give you even better gifts? Foundational. Foundational. What, what did God do here for Solomon? Solomon asked for discernment and judgment and wisdom. And look what happens. 1 Kings 3, uh, verse 13. This, this is prayer moves the heart of God. It did it for Solomon. I mean, look what he says. He goes, so in addition, the fact that you uh, didn't ask for all these other things, verse 13, he says, I will give you what you did not ask for. I'll give you riches and honor so that no king will be your equal during your entire life. God's like, Solomon, I am going to pour out my blessings on your life. I, I, it brings me great pleasure to pour out my blessings on your life, Solomon. 
No one will be compared to you. No one will be compared to you. And so I, I, I want us to be a people who are going like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to petition of the Father. I've said this before, and so I'll say it again. Um, I'm going to always lean on asking for more of the Father and leaving it in the Father's hand than asking for less and not receiving it. If God does not say yes to my prayers, it will not be because I'm not asking for those things. The only part that we control when it comes to a life of prayer is the request from our mouth to the Father. That's it. And so we press in. He, he wants to do this. Okay, look, look at this, verse 14. I want to draw our attention here because we're beginning to see... Um, the, rea the unfortunate reality of Solomon's later years. First King 3, 14, it says this. So he said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you all these things. And then verse 14, he says, If you walk in my ways and keep my statutes and commands, just as your father David did, I will give you a long life. Okay, so we have a condition here where he, God the Father says to Solomon, D Solomon, if you'll trust me and follow me, I'll give you a long life. If you're, you're staying in my statues here. Okay, now let's fast forward to the second part of Solomon's life. So you have a Bible, 1 Kings chapter 11. Go ahead and turn to 1 Kings chapter 11, or scroll to 1 Kings chapter 11, whatever you got. So this is the beginning part, 1 Kings chapter 3 is the beginning part of Solomon's life. We're seeing it's doing all right. 1 Kings chapter 11. We're going to skip around here, but we'll be between 4 and 10 of 1 Kings 11. All right, here's what it says. It says, when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away to follow other gods. He was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord his God as his father David had been. Now, 1 Kings 11 goes on to explain that he is uh, building up in high places. He's setting up places for these foreign gods uh, based around uh, his wives. 1 Kings 11, verse 8. So it says he, he did the same for all of his foreign wives who were burning incense and, incense and offering sacrifices to their god. So uh, 1 Kings 11 tells us that Solomon has now grown old. He's been walking uh, with the Lord. We'll look at a graph and say basically the first 30 years of Solomon's life going pretty well. And then we get to the second kind of part, the last 10 years of his reign. And it tells us that in his old age, the idolatry of his wife is now leading him uh, away. Now, it's not his wife's leading him away. It's, it's his own heart. That's leading him away, but we'll, we'll see that in a second. Uh, 1 Kings 11, verse 9, look what happens. It says, the Lord was angry with Solomon. Why is he angry with Solomon? Because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. And he had commanded him about this, so that he would not follow other gods. But, there's that conjunction again. But Solomon did not do what the Lord had commanded. It's a, a tragic ending to incredible leadership of Solomon. I mean, he built the temple. We, we looked in our series on the presence of God this past summer, how when Solomon dedicates the temple, right, he, he prays and he just says, God, if, you, if your spirit doesn't fall upon this temple, if you don't come into this uh, tabernacle, into this place, we are a lost people. It was an incredible moment for the nation of Israel. And the guy leading this moment was Solomon. We have other stories about the, the wisdom of Solomon where the, there's that classic story uh, there used to be a cartoon show. I can't remember when, it, when I was young. Uh, Hysteria. I think it was called Hysteria. And it was like a, a history kind of show that was on, on public cable television. Anyways, so, and it, told, it actually told this story of, of Solomon, right, where these two women bring the, this baby before Solomon. And it shows this incredible wisdom where he, he is able to discern between which one the, the living baby actually belongs to. It's this incredible, uh, it's, it's an incredible story. He, read the Song of Solomon, it's, it's provocative, and um, you read it, you're like, this brother, he is, we're getting, he's getting, it's okay, and, and, but it's, it's, it's really incredible work, I mean, there, there's so many of the things, Ecclesiastes, so many of the things that, that were just incredible works that have honored the church, that the church had learned from, for many years, and you get the second, the end part of his life, and it says, when he is old, his heart is turned away. What a tragic ending. 
I'm going to throw up uh, this, this, this graphic. This is kind of the relational journey of Solomon. Uh, David was in band, so he's kind of a band nerd. Um, and he, said, he says this is the crescendo and the decrescendo of the life of love of Solomon. Um, so if you're looking at this relational journey of Solomon, uh, it begins with humble submission where Solomon just says, man, I see what you, I see what you have and I, I want to honor you. I want to honor what you've given me and I want to live uh, a, a life with you. And so we see this theme emerge of love. Uh, we see at the birth of Solomon, this comes from 2 Samuel 12, 24. I'll just, it won't be on the screen, I'll run through this quickly. At the birth of Solomon, uh, the reader has told us that the Lord loved him. This is 2 Samuel 12, verse 24. At the beginning of his reign in 1 Kings 3, verse 3, the narrator states that Solomon loved uh, the Lord and that his love was expressed in this type of uh, devotion that he has. In 1 Kings 10, verse Verse 9, the queen of Sheba asserts that God has made Solomon king. It's a sign that God loves his people. So this queen says God loves his people. The, the reason we know God loves his people is because he has given us Solomon to lead his people. And then sadly in 1 Kings chapter 10 verse 9 in a ironic reuse of the same Hebrew word for love. It says, in talking about Solomon's perverted love in 1 Kings 11, 1 through 12, it says, King Solomon loved many women. He clung to these in love. And so we have this journey of humble submission and devotion of love to God that then finds itself in the second part of Solomon's life in self-idolatry. Now, here's the issue. What, what was, the, what was the, the problem that Solomon had? Uh, Solomon ultimately had a desire problem. Uh, Christian leaders, great leaders who, who fail, they have a desire problem. Uh, it's not that they have a knowledge problem. We are a desire-driven uh, people. You can have all the wealth and all the wisdom in the world, but at the end of the day, you will be driven by your desires. Solomon had more wisdom given to him. Uh, Solomon had wisdom given to him by God. He was more, uh, had more intellectual uh, ability. And, and we see in the story that intellectual understanding wasn't enough. Uh, many leaders have fallen who have uh, lots of, of biblical knowledge. Biblical knowledge and love and devotion to God are not the same thing. To understand the, the Bible, uh, some of the most um, arrogant and unloving people that I've ever met know the Bible inside and out. Inside and out. Uh, they, they would not know God if he walked in the back door. Wouldn't recognize him. There's something more than knowledge. It's actually about what you desire as a person. You can have biblical knowledge, but the desire um, to, to, to know God at a deeper level, you've you got to align your desire. Uh, one author, uh, James K. A. Smith, uh, he's, written a, he's written a ton on this idea that we are, um, basically what James K. A. Smith is, he says that the idea of behavior driven by desire, he says that we are not primarily thinking things. Uh, so we're in Boston. Uh, we, we kind of lean more towards the kind of intellectual side of things, right? So we take a bit of pride in our education. That, that's a, for a lot of reasons why people go here. That, that's kind of the, the cultural idol for us would be intellect, right? So if L.A. is, L.A. would be like fame, right? That's the cultural idol of L.A. The cultural idol of New York would probably be power, right? You go to New York if you're trying to exert power. If you're wanting fame, you go to L.A. If you're wanting intellect, you come to Boston. That's the cultural idol of our city in particular, right? All of these different cities have different cultural idols that they lean towards. And intellectual knowledge, biblical knowledge alone, will not ensure that you live a life that honors God. And so James K. Smith says that we're not just thinking things who make decisions based solely on intellectual knowledge. He, he basically argues that our core motivations are often unconscious 
that are formed by what we worship or devote ourselves to. Now, in his work, he, he basically says that our desires and our affections are shaped over time by what he calls cultural liturgies. Cultural liturgies. These are basically repeated practices and habits in our society that capture our imaginations and direct our desires. So these cultural liturgies, they could be anything from consumerism to sports fandom to political loyalty, and they're shaping our hearts more profoundly than we often realize. So James K. Smith says that we have these cultural liturgies that we're all operating in, and we, if, we, if we're not careful to pay attention, these cultural liturgies shape us in a certain way that turn our desires away from God and turn them towards something else. And so consumerism is shaping you, it's forming you into something, and it's moving you away from godliness and, and a life that looks like Jesus, and it's turning you more towards someone who is what? Interested in self-pleasure and self-desire. We, again, we have these cultural liturgies that are shaping us in these unique ways. And, and it's basically this idea that we are a desire-controlled people. Now, Solomon's life is a lesson in not dealing with some of his base-level desires. Apparently for Solomon, there was something attached to him uh, with having multiple wives. It was something from the very beginning. Now listen, um, the scripture, many times the scripture is descriptive of what is happening and we're assuming that the scripture is prescribing how we should live. So in the Old Testament, when it talks about how uh, these kings or we, we get these things where we're, we're kind of reading it and going like, that feels not godly to live that way. All the Bible is doing is describing what is happening. It's not prescribing how you should live. So God was not pleased by Solomon having multiple wives. This is actually what's going to bring him down. And so he never dealt with, Solomon had the wisdom, but he didn't deal with the desire that he had in his heart. This was ultimately controlling him. Now here, here's the... Um, Here's the updated uh, graph that you can go ahead and hit that. Now, he here's the issue. He here's the thing about desire. And the, the reason that we have to pay attention to it is that desire ultimately determines the direction. And if you don't get a handle on what you actually desire, you'll be moving in a direction that you never anticipated. And, and before you realize it, your, your base level desires, what you actually want out of life, will have carried you somewhere that you were never, in, you would have never explicitly said that they were going to carry you to. Solomon began in humble submission and love of God and moved towards this self idolatry. He had been given them, think about this. Solomon had been given the mantle of leadership over the people of Israel. And, and instead of, of taking this mantle of leadership over God's people that he received from God himself, he took this mantle and he, he abused it and he used it for self-gratification. God said, I'm giving you this to Stuart. And, and, and in the beginning it was going well, but he didn't deal with something that was going on underneath him and then he squanders and loses it. I wonder... How many of us, out of a refusal to deal with what's actually underneath us, is squandering the things that God is seeking to do in your life? We just came out of a series on, on stewardship where we basically looked at how all of us have time or um, resources, treasure, all of us have giftings. And everybody in the room has, has gifts. Everybody in the room has resources, whether big or small. Everyone in the room has time. And, and, and the, the goal in, in Christian discipleship is to go, am I taking these things and am I using these things for the glorification of God and the flourishing of my neighbor? And so the question is, are you squandering what God has given you for self-gratification, self-preservation? 
and self-pleasure. Solomon's life is a warning uh, that allowing these seemingly small things to grow until your heart is turned. We saw in the beginning text, it says that he worshiped God, but he also worshiped and sacrificed to other gods on high places. This is a lesson in not tearing down the high places. Let me say this again. Everyone look at me. Solomon's life is a lesson in not tearing down the high places. What do I mean by that? You have things in your life. You have struggles and desires in your life. Maybe you exaggerate the truth. Maybe you fudge on your numbers at work. Maybe you're a little flirtatious with someone who's not your spouse. Uh, maybe um, you're a little flirtatious with someone else who's someone else's spouse. I don't know. Whatever it is. Let, let me tell you something. Here's what's going to happen. If you do not tear down the high places, that will take you to a place that you never anticipated it taking you to. And, and, and I've, so, I've spoken to so many people who've absolutely blown up their life. And anyone who's blown up their life, they, no one has ever really said to me, when I started out, you know, it was this little thing, and I was doing this thing, and I was going after this thing. No one ever said to me, uh, yeah, my goal was to absolutely destroy and blow up my entire life. It was never the goal. But it was a refusal to tear down the high place. Some of you have some high places you need to tear down. You need to come out into the light. You say, I'm going to deal with this thing, man, because this thing's going to, this kind of thing is going to take me down. It, it will grow. It will grow. It will grow. One sin is never an isolated event. Uh, Solomon's desires would affect the entire nation of Israel. They would never, the nation would never recover from Solomon's sin. It wasn't an isolated thing. It actually split the, the kingdom. His refusal to deal with whatever was um, plaguing his relationship with God, he, he, he didn't deal with it. In, you know what I think in the end? Let me just be really honest with you. You know what I think um, a, a lot of reasons that great leaders just fail? You know what I think we've lost in 2024? I think we don't fear God anymore. I think we don't fear him anymore. I think we live as if his scriptures aren't true, as if there aren't consequences to our sin. I just think we don't fear him anymore. It's not a super popular thing. I just think there's no fear anymore. But he's a God of the universe. He sees everything. And he wants to pour out his blessing on your life. But, but he's also not to be trifled with. He's not to be played around with. I've been thinking a lot about ending well. I'm, I'm still pretty young. I was sitting with a guy yesterday. He was 28. And he was like, you know, our generation. I was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I told Katie, I was like, he's 28, and he just said, our generation, babe, I feel good. <laughs> now, it was 6 p.m., and I was tired, but I felt good. All right. I think a lot, uh, as I've gotten older, I think a lot about ending well. And um, I know we're kind of all over the spectrum in terms of our demographic, and so if you're younger, we don't really like to think about that. We don't like to think about ending well. I think it's probably a valuable exercise to say, man, am I, am I going to, like, does my life, where I'm at right now, am I trusting and following in the way of Jesus? Have I given my life to Christ? Am I moving in the direction that I want to be moving in? Will I finish well? Now, if you're on the back end of life, right? The, the question for you on the back end of life, so I'm 40, right? So I'm, you know, mid-age, whatever. If you're on that back end of that, you're going, man, am I, am I ending this well? Am I stewarding well? Or am I, am I, have I turned inward now? Paul says, and I'll close, 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. This is, the, this is, I think, the prayer that I want for myself and that I want for our church as we just think about this. This is what Paul writes to Timothy. 
Paul's at the, towards the end of his life when he's writing these instructions to this young leader. I think it fits perfectly in with, with looking at the life of Solomon. He says, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, and I've kept the faith. There is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. So the question is, do you, do you live a life that loves his appearing? James 1, verse 2, and then I'll pray for us. James writes to this, he says, Blessed is the one who endures trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Let's pray. Father, we need your help to live a life that is pleasing to you. We thank you that you've given us the Holy Spirit as a helper, that those who have trusted Christ, your scriptures say, are given a helper, a mediator, a counselor, that it's not of our own power. We can't willpower a life that's pleasing to you. It's dependency on your spirit. It's informed by your scripture. It's living in community with others. And so I pray this morning for my brothers and sisters in the room. Maybe they're in the room this morning and their life is moving in a direction that they recognize will lead to destruction. That if they don't deal with this particular thing, it will destroy their relationships. Father, I pray for courage this morning. I pray that you would press in. God, I pray for the brother and sister in the room, perhaps when it comes to their, their work, at their job. They've just got this habit that they know is not honoring to you. It's alienating. Father, would you show that to them? God, would you make us into a steady people? A people who, who trust you. A people who want to steward what you've given us. God, would you help us? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.